Everybody ready? Ready. Good. So we are talking about. I'm. Um, it, it might might be a little bit longer than just one day, but let's start uh, with neo complex and white complex taking quite a quick reference for you, especially for the new fellows. I think there's a lot of important information. Okay. So we may not be able to finish it, and uh, as as most of you know, this is all interactive. So um, I want you to participate. There is. No, you know, wrong answer. Um, so I don't want to be embarrassed if you don't get it. Um, so it's very laid back. But the more we participate, the more I know what you know and it's, you know, what your pro thought process, uh, process is. Okay, so of course, this doesn't apply to Baby Mansu. If he gets it wrong, he's in big trouble. So let's start. Okay, narrow complex tachycardia. We go a little bit over the normal activation, we talk about the mechanism of tachycardia. Differential diagnosis by the ECG, and then we go a little bit over treatment. And I dip a little bit into the EP world with the treatment, um, and you'll see a little bit, uh, but it will be very superficial. Good. Normal activation, as you all know, activation starts in the right atrium sinus node, um, spreads from here over the right as well as left atrium. It goes into the AV node, slows down, and then via the specialized conduction system activates the right as well as left ventricle. And the activation is very simultaneously via the hypokinesis system, right? Um, as you know, slowing down has in, in the AV node has two functions. One is you want to coordinate the electrical activation with a mechanical activation. So you, a mechanical activation, of course, is much, much slower. Uh, and because of that, you have to have some slowing in the AV node. The other reason is you have to have slowing here because in case you get atrial fibrillation and don't have slowing here, you would not survive atrial fibrillation, would be a very lethal arrhythmia. So that is your normal activation. And the normal activation is shown again here schematically in this area here. This happens basically in the Hispokinji system. So if you have a, a, a Hispokinji fiber, that can happen in a very, very small area, but it happens also in other areas. You basically have two areas here. You have A, divides and branches in B1 and B2, and then you have a branch here in C, which is the, uh, just the general myocardium. And the normal activation starts here, goes via B1, B2, very simultaneously, very quick. Then it meets in the area of C, and once you don't have any excitable myocardium anymore, your activation wavefront dies out. Now, re-entry, as most of you probably know, is the most common reason for our arrhythmias. And what happens is you have the substrate here with B1 and B2, and um, the conduction properties in B1 and B2 might not be the same. For instance, there could be ischemia here and conduction might be slowing in this area or refractory period is very long in this area. Now, when you have a trigger, and this is, uh, is seen here with a star, a trigger means a PAC or PVC. What happens, it can still conduct via B1, but because refractory period here or you have injured tissue, it cannot conduct via B2. Then it can conduct via C here and comes back via B2 and conduction backwards might be possible. And if this is possible and slow enough and the activation wavefront arrives in this area here, um, if enough time has passed, this tissue is no longer refractory and then this circuit movement can repeat itself and you have a tachycardia established. So as you can see, the, the, the requirements for re-entry is number one is you have a substrate, right? Uh, B1 and B2. So you have two alternate uh, pathways. You have to have a trigger here uh, in form of a PAC, PVC, sometimes more than one. And then you have to have slow enough conduction via this re-entry circuit to allow that the tissue here is no longer refractory and the re-entry circuit can be established. So these are the conditions for re-entry tachycardia, and um, this is actually what happens in a lot of areas in your myocardium. So, for instance, in your AV node, this may happen. You have two pathways, and as you know, the refractory period in these pathways it might be a little bit different. So if you have a PAC, go in one area of your node, and I show you where the areas are in a little bit. May block here, but can use the alternate pathway, and if this conduction is slow enough around here, 
you have a reentrant circuit we um, established within your AV node. Very, very common arrhythmia, as you know. Good. So what are the supraventric arrhythmias we're we talking about? Well, oops. Anybody knows? What kind of typical arrhythmias? What do you what do you what do you know, what do you know about arrhythmias? Which are the common ones? AFib, A flutter, AV naughty, Okay. Good. Okay. So sinus tachycardia, right? Does that is one arrhythmia. You have atrial flutter. Um, that is most of the time typical. You have atrial fibrillation, then you have atrial tachycardias, which could be caused by reentry or focal. You have AV nodal reentry tachycardia, is a very common arrhythmia in all age groups. You have AV RT, so AV reentry tachycardia, caused by accessory pathways. And these ones you need to know. And then there are very rare supraventricular arrhythmias and sometimes even ventricular arrhythmias that may originate in the auric cusp. Or Maheim, this is a very slowly conducting um, arrhythmias. And then the arrhythmias where you have an accessory pathway coming from your node into your ventricle. So these are very rare ones. Uh, for general purposes, you really don't know, need to know about those. Okay. Sinus tachycardia. So sinus tachycardia originates obviously in the sinus node. What you need to do is don't treat your sinus tachycardia, treat the underlying cause. Okay. So look, why does the patient have sinus tachycardia? So it's pain, hypovolemia, hyperthyroidism, fever. So look for the many, many, many other reasons um, for sinus tachycardia. Don't treat it. Don't give patients a beta blocker. Treat the underlying cause. There are rare causes for sinus tachycardia. There's an inappropriate sinus tachycardia. And then there's a syndrome called POTS. And uh, people are, in, you know, may not disagree what POTS is. So this is postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome. So patients change their positions, and when they are standing upright, they develop tachycardia. It is defined uh, an increase of your heart rate uh, 20 to 30 percent within two minutes of standing. So you can do a tilt table test and and see that patients shoot up with their heart rate. In general, this is you know something that here is related to your autonomic nervous system. So you find it in a lot of young people. I don't want to give them necessarily the diagnosis of POTS. We used to treat inappropriate sinus tachycardias with ablation of your AV node close to the AV node and try to modify the AV node. This is completely abandoned. Um, it, number one, it's not working. Number two, a lot of uh, young patients were winding up with a pacemaker, which you really don't want to do. Okay, so sinus tachycardia. All right, now it's your turn. What kind of tachycardia is that? I think one of the first years can take this one. Oh, yeah. Guys, can you introduce yourself, the first years? Hello, Krishman. It's Manish. Hey, Manish, how are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Any other first years? Yeah, I'm here, Doctor. This is Mahmoud. Hey, Mahmoud, how are you? So, good, good, another one. <laughs> All right, guys, what do you think? This looks like sinus tech. Looks like this one. Okay. There's, uh, there's multiple P's, uh, probably, it looks like uh, the A flutter, to be honest, it's a... Uh, so we have atrial flutter, okay, anybody else? Yeah, this is Mahmoud Doctor. I think it is sinus tachycardia, as mm -hmm. I see a B wave before every QRS okay. complex. I see, uh, I mean, in the lead to and the longest strip, I see there is uh, one wave that mm -hmm. is coming early. So you see here, you see a P wave in front of the QS complex, right? Yep. Okay, so th th that's good that we go over this. All right, so if you look very carefully in the tracing, if you say sinus tachycardia, so what I want you to, to realize, your rhythm, and sinus tachycardia is not necessarily defined by one P wave in front of the QRS complex. 
but you have to also assess the morphology of your P wave before the um, uh, QS complex. And sinus rhythm is an um, arrhythmia, or if you have sinus tachycardia, that originates in the sinus node, right? So your right and left atrium gets activated from right to left and from top to bottom. So your P wave has to be positive, okay? okay. In the inferior leads, 2, 3, AVF. And if you look in the P wave in 2, 3, AVF, see that? The initial part is clearly, clearly negative, right? So because of that, this cannot be sinus tachycardia. And then I want to look here a little bit closer. Do you see anything else that is a little bit strange, more closer to the QRS complex? It looks like atrial tachycardia. So atrial tachycardia is differential, yeah. But look at what, what, what is this here? See that? Yeah. yeah. And if you had a caliber, which you don't have, unfortunately, if you had a caliber, this marches out exactly. So now you have two negative P waves. And this, if you could slow this down a little bit further and have three to one conduction, you would see a nice sort with pattern negative two, three AVF. The P wave is positive in U1. And you don't see it. Here's, you see it a little bit. See that? This is negative in V6. So this is atrial flutter. So Atrial flutter, as you know, is a reentrant circuit that is located in the right atrium. So it goes down the lateral wall of your right atrium, comes up the septum, and then activates the right atrium at roughly 300 beats per minute, okay? The left atrium gets activated via the coronary sinus, which sits here, comes in the back, and then from the bottom to the top, the left atrium gets activated. And therefore, you have negative P waves because the majority of the atria gets activated from the bottom to the top, okay? Now, the ventricles are often activated in a two-to-one fashion. Rate control is difficult. So if your heart has a regular rhythm, a rate control often is difficult. And as you may know from experience, uh, often you need more than one nodal storm um, um, medication to get the rate down, okay? So hallmarks of flutter, is negative in 2, 3 AVF, positive in V1, negative in V6. And I want to look at something here. So this is a model here. This is a tricuspid annulus. This big hole you see is your IVC, okay? And the flutter has to squeeze through this isthmus here that is created anteriorly here by the tricuspid annulus. And in the back, is, um, there's a barrier, is your IVC. And your flutter has to squeeze through this isthmus here. So, and that is very important because if you want to get rid of the flutter, you can because you can ablate this isthmus, okay? So, treatment is rate control, dutizin beta blocker, digoxin, and sometimes you have to add as well. Patients with flutter need anticoagulation if they have risk factors or if they have a cardioversion. Um, if they have no risk factors, anticoagulation. Usually you do for four weeks after, and then you stop the anticoagulation, but um, uh, you should anticoagulate for four weeks, even in patients who do not have risk factors. So cardioversion is, is a quick fix, um, is always successful, and ablation is a more permanent fix um, of atrial flutter. So, and that's how it looks like when you do an ablation. So remember the model I showed you, you have here the tricuspid annulus, the IVC sits here, here you have a, what's called a halo catheter that sits in the right atrium. And what these catheters do, they show you the electrical activity during flutter. You can study it and you see that the electrical activity goes from this area to this area here by all these electrical poles, okay? You have this catheter here and you have one catheter here in the corner of sinus, okay? So what you do is you put this ablation catheter towards the tricuspid annulus and then you drag, oops, drag it back all the way to the IVC, and this basically cuts a line across the isthmus where the flutter has to go through. Basically goes here, up here, around here through the isthmus, and goes up here. So that's what you do. You drag a line here, and if this line is complete, then you do not have any uh, option. The flutter has no option to go around, and the flutter is terminated, and hopefully permanently terminated. And that's how it looks like in a model. So this is a three-dimensional mapping system. And what you see here, this is his area. You have a big tricuspid annulus. You have the IVC, 
okay? And what you do is you start your ablation here and each of these little dots shows you an area that was ablated, okay? So each red is one ablation spot. So you drag the catheter back and this, you ablate the isthmus here and when this line is complete, no electricity can go through there, uh, then your flutter terminates. Often it terminates a little bit before this line is complete because where it has a squeeze, through, squeeze through, gets more and more narrow. So, uh, but when this line, when this line is complete, your your flutter terminates, and if they are bidirectional block, it's cured in ninety five percent of the cases. Okay, that was flutter. So the older fellows have seen this, unfortunately. So I think who hasn't seen it should should try first. Guys, who can volunteer? So it's a little bit misleading, right? It's the origin of this tachycardia, and you look at this and say, where is the tachycardia, right? <laughs> Yeah, it's like I don't see any P waves here. Okay. So it's an arrow. Is it like junctional escape rhythm? Oh, that's a good point. Junctional. So you're on the right leg. Yeah, that's that's good because it's fairly irregular, right? You don't see P waves. Yeah, and there are like U waves in V two and V three. U waves. Okay. So you don't think this is a P wave, right? Right. No P wave. And that's yeah. correct. That's a U wave. So yeah. P wave do not look that broad mm -hmm. in, in the pre-core elite. So it would not be a P wave. Good. Okay. So you said junction, right? That's good. Mm -hmm. Any tachycardia do you see? Uh, I wonder if it was uh, a fib. All that, right. That has uh, like the, the conduction has completely blocked. So the, the rhythm is now coming from junctional. All right. So you think this is a fib with complete heart block, right? Mm -hmm. Must be right. So mm -hmm. if it's never regular, this is a very regular rhythm, right? Yeah. And there's no P wave. So this is a fairly slow rhythm. So you have two rhythms here. You have junction escape rhythm in the setting of atrial fibrillation. And you see TNV1, you see a little oscillation here. It's a very, very fine atrial fibrillation with a junctional escape rhythm. Good. And you see also something else. So there's conduction disease, right? There's a fairly whitish QS complex. It's left anterior fascicular block, possibly. So um, this is not a healthy heart. So, mm -hmm. and I always ask the fellows, this is someone who was referred for a cardioversion. Do you cardiovert this patient? No. No. Yeah. Did I hear no? Yeah, because the post cardio version on his rate will be like 10 beats a minute. Say, say it again. So post cardio version, I guess his rate will be very, very slow. Our problem very slow. Oh, that's good. Why would it be slow? Completely flat. Just because once you shock these kind of rhythms, they don't yeah. go back. There will be like no rhythm. There won't be no rhythm. That is a good possibility, right? Right, that was more marked. Yeah, okay, good. So, if you shock someone with, with an escape rhythm, uh, you're absolutely right. So, the escape rhythm is not necessarily as stable as sinus rhythm, right? I mean, this is a junctional rhythm, most likely. Um, but if you suppress a junctional rhythm, um, you may have a long time before you have an escape rhythm because even if you have a sinus rhythm, it may not be conducted in complete half block. That's exactly right. Uh, we see this very frequently when you put in a pacemaker. If uh, you have someone who has even a ventricular escape rhythm coming from the left anterior fascicle or from the left posterior fascicle, once you put a lead in the ventricle and you cause PVCs and the lead is not in a good position, you have to draw it back. Very frequently, the patient does not have an underlying rhythm, so they have a flat line. Um, and the same is true if you cardiovert someone like this. Okay, so you don't cardiovert. So atrial fibrillation, as you know, is the most common arrhythmia caused by multiple wavelets in the right as well as in the left atria. It's relatively easy to rate controlled. ECG, you have no P waves. 
It's irregular, irregular. So atrial fibrillation is never regular. So there's no pattern to the irregularity. Compared to flutter, there is often a, a pattern to the irregularity. Or if you have um, you you, ha you have heart block, uh, Winkelbach, you always have a pattern to the irregularity. And typically, what you see you see slight variation in the QRS complex because of the irregularity. Your filling is a little different, and therefore your axis shifts a little bit from beat to beat. Good treatment. So rate control, um, beta blocker, detoxin, digoxin. If you want to achieve back sinus rhythm, digoxin might not be a great medication. Digoxin shortens your refractory period in the atria and makes atrial fibrillation a little bit more likely. If you opt for 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 uh, for weight control only, digoxin is allowed. Anticoagulation according to the risk factors. Cardioversion is often successful, but that's not the problem. The problem is to keep patients in normal rhythm. Uh, and in, in order to do so, often we have to um, do rhythm control with antiarrhythmics, and Chris Pickett will talk a little bit about this more, or you can ablate patients with atrial fibrillation. Okay, so how do we do this? And this is an interesting slide that's uh, actually fairly old. And what you see here on this side here, and so the reason is uh, what we do in atrial fibrillation, we ablate the triggers for atrial fibrillation, okay? So this is a pulmonary vein. Well, let's shoot some contrast, and there is a catheter in your pulmonary vein. And you see the surface ECG on this side here. Just focus on, on this side here. So you have 1, 2, and 3 NV1. You have a P wave, and you have a QRS complex. And when you put your catheter into a pulmonary vein, and this is done by a French guy, his name is Hesseger, a very world-famous electrophysiologist. So what you see here, you have two poles, one, two, and three, four. So we have a four-pole catheter, and this is the electricity that is recorded at the area of your catheter, okay? So one, two is all the way at the tip here, at the source, and three, four is a little bit further out. Okay, and this is the electricity that is recorded to sinus rhythm, right? Uh, so you have electricity here, that's your atrium, and then you have electricity, more sharp spike, that is further into your pulmonary vein. So look at this area here, what happens, right? You have a PAC, and look what the catheter records that sits all the way in your pulmonary vein. You see a sharp spike here, this is a spontaneous electrical activity that originates in your pulmonary vein here and then conducts from your pulmonary vein to the outside to your left atrium and causes here atrial activity. All right, guys? And what you see, this is a pulmonary vein firing, electrical spontaneous activity within your pulmonary vein that gets conducted to your atria. And these firings, if they are frequent enough and fast enough, these pushes push you into atrial fibrillation. And because he found this out and how he did this, he put people with proximal atrial fibrillation on the table, put catheters in these veins, and was waiting for spontaneous activity, and he found this. So this is why we can nowadays ablate atrial fibrillation, because what we do is we put a catheter across the septum, you put a lasso catheter in your pulmonary vein to record the electrical activity, that shows you how we go um, from the right to the left side. We poke through the septum in the fossa ovalis. We put the catheter in your pulmonary vein here. And what we do then is we ablate, these are the red spots, around those pulmonary veins. On the left side here, there was, this is a common pulmonary vein. And on the right side, and we electrically isolate these veins. And if this isolation is complete and the line is uh, complete, uh, complete, there's conduction block from the outside to the inside, and from the inside from the vein to the outside. So this is the reason why we can ablate atrial fibrillation. Basically, you have the substrate here, these electrical wavelets that get initiated by pulmonary vein firing. So the trigger we abolish in atrial fibrillation ablation. Okay. Dr. Smith, can I ask a question? If you must, no, sure. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I know the pulmonary vein ablation and um, mm -hmm. oscillation is one of the things 
Is this the only uh, way we can blade the AFib or are there are other ways just like we do Flutter? So there are many, many, many different approaches in many different labs. Um, so sometimes we look for little uh, fossae that we are played. Um, and sometimes it's not just the pulmonary veins, uh, but sometimes you have vein firing from the um, cable veins, from the inferior and the superior vein. Then you would isolate those veins. Um, and then there are some uh, proponents who cut more lines into your left atrium. For instance, you could cut a line from the left superior vein to the to the mitral of isthmus. So the theory is that you allow fewer and fewer wavelets to run around your atrium. Mm -hmm. now, if you look at the data, um, you know, despite all of this, the mainstay of the therapy is truly the primary veins. And if you see firing from different areas, uh, and the most common one is around the coronary uh, sinus os and around the cable veins. You can isolate those as well. A everything else, uh, if you look at the data, is actually not too helpful. The right. problem is if you cut the, your left atrium into pieces with lines and these lines are not complete, guess what happens? You create left-sided atrial flutter, which is difficult to um, ablate. So the best center to do that would be Bordeaux. Uh, and there's another electrophysiologist who is very experienced in this. Um, they are, have a high success rate um, of plating left-sided atrial flutter. It's not easy. I can tell from my experience, it's not easy to get rid of those. So therefore, in general, you'd only do the, the pulmonary veins and then you'll see what happens. Okay, next tachycardia. Thank you. This looks like uh, so. Vivan has uh, uh, this is like pseudo R waves, which we see in like AVNRT. AVNRT. <coughs> okay. This could be like slow fast AVNRT. Slow fast. Oh, that's interesting. Good. So, do you see P waves, guys? Yeah. Yeah. Where are they? Before the QRS. Okay, w. Oh, who's a W? <laughs> That's the <Yeah>. other way. <laughs> Sanivas, you were... <laughs> I don't know. It wasn't me. You could help it, but you had to give it away. So, <laughs> so... <laughs> it wasn't me. <laughs> okay. So it, these are P waves here, right? Every degrees? Yeah. So this is tachycardia. And Sunima so says, look at this, this is W. So this is a very, very interesting morphology of a P wave. It's not sinus rhythm, everybody agrees, right? Sinus rhythm, positive, two, three, if you have first component negative, you have a little positive, then negative again. So this looks like a W. And this, in fact, is an atrial tachycardia that is focal and is called W tachycardia. It comes from, okay. the, from the tricuspid annulus, often from the lateral tricuspid annulus, but you have to map it very carefully. So, what do you see here? Mm -hmm. uh, this. Mm. Another W tachycardia. It's another a W, John. Yeah. Yeah. The start. So what happens? So here's, here's W tachycardia. Right? You see this negative here. What happens after this? It's without a P. Uh, there's nothing. There's a pause, right? Yeah. And then there's what? The P? Yeah. Right? Right? And here, another P. W, P, W, P, W, W. Yeah. So, what happened here? Either possibly adenosine? Adenosine would be one option. Okay. Oh. And oh. in fact, sometimes these, these tachycardias could be they could be uh, caused by adenosine, yeah. 
or ba bagel. So they, they're responsive yeah. sometimes. Uh, Good. I didn't see one option. What else? Yeah, something that inhibited its automaticity, uh, like like the increase in vagal tone or decrease in sympathetic activity. Oh, all right. There we go. So someone did something bad to the patient, and that would be me. So <laughs> this is core sinus massage. And I may have told you this. Uh, you, you know this. So this is someone who comes to the office with this tachycardia, and his wife was present, and he almost passed out when I did this. So don't do this with relatives in the room, because this type of tachycardia is actually responsive and uh, is influenced by your autonomic nervous system. Um, so some atrial tachycardias are indeed. So, and this is this clearly was the case. So you could suppress it by coronary sinus massage, but look what happens afterwards. And you let go, and then the tachycardia comes back. So this is someone who had basically incessant um, atrial tachycardia coming from the tricuspid annulus. Good. So atrial tachycardias, they can be two to one, often one to one. Um, and because of that, they are a little bit more difficult to rate control. Remember, the P wave in general is different from your sinus P waves. The problem sometimes is that the P wave, if originates, if the tachycardia originates from the crystal, um, it might be very similar. So in this case, it's helpful if you have an old EKG. Uh, Coral sinus massage helps you. Sometimes the P wave is hidden in the T wave, um, so this helps you and differentiate. These tachycardias, they can be re-entry or can be have, have an autonomic focus. Okay, rate control, beta blocker, dutiazem, sometimes they're difficult to rate control. Cardiovision, in cases of auto, if they are autonomic and influenced by their autonomic nervous system, often they are incessant and frequent. So very frequently you have to ablate these tachycardias. So you look where the focus is, go with the catheter there, and then you ablate those. Okay. We'll have one of the first here try try this one. Yeah, this is Mahmoud. So I see a very fast heart rate, almost 115. I don't see B wave. Um, yeah. I think this is SVT. Yeah. Definitely. So you know, B waves is it regular? Yeah. yeah, it is regular for me. It's so regular, right? Yeah. Okay. This could be, I, I mean, this could be SVT or, I mean, so SVT is definitely correct, right? You don't, yeah. uh, you don't see, and you don't see clear P wave. So the question now is, what kind of SVT is the most likely one? So if you have SVT, so in it's irregular, so atrial fibrillation is highly unlikely, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's not right wrong. So so if you have an irregular SVT when A fib and A flat is out of the picture and you don't see P waves, what uh, is the differential diagnosis for those? I mean atrial flutter is still one of them. A flutter? Could be A V and R T and or could be A V and R T with orthodromic conduction. Right. So flutter it might be, sometimes you don't see it. It's a little bit too fast for flutter, right? So it's less likely, but yeah. Okay, AVNRT, atrial tachycardia, EVR the bypass tract. So which one is the most likely? What do you think? AVNRT. AV, what was that? AVNRT? Yep. Yeah, so that is uh, the most likely tachycardia. So it could be atrial tachycardia as well. Could it be a bypass tract tachycardia? WW. Still, yes. Uh, with uh, with with antidromic conduction. Yeah. With orthodromic conduction. Orthodromic so conduction. Down the normal conduction system, back the bypass. So, so. Uh, I think it's less likely to be AVRT because AVRT 
um, the P wave tends to come because it's a longer circuit. So it comes a little bit okay. after the QRS. So, and that is important to remember. If you have a bypass tract, you should see at least part of the P wave at the end of the QRS complex and it marches usually out of the QRS complex. And the reason is if you have orthostromic AVRT, it goes down your normal conduction system using your AV node, it's the system and comes back your bypass tract. And this is what Justice uh, rightfully uh, pointed out. This takes time. You have to go down all the way. You have to go via your normal myocardium and then come back via your accessory pathway. And this takes at least minimum, even if it's a septal bypass tract, 70 milliseconds. So because of that, you should see a P wave at the end of your crest And that is what you don't see here. And, uh, you know, as you said um, correctly, there is really no P wave or part of the P wave that you see here. So it could be AVNRT. Is it impossible? Could this be atrial tachycardia? We don't see P waves there, right? Mm -hmm. With a very long first degree. Yeah. AV. Yeah, John. So it could be if it if you have a dual AV node, you have atrial tachycardia that conducts one to one and the P wave sits within the QS complex with a long AV conduction, you basically have, if you look at, at AVL, you have a P wave sitting in the QS complex with a long conduction causing this QS complex. This could be atrial tachycardia still, but you know, very, very likely AV nodal oriented tachycardia. Good. So, what do you think? Looks like, uh, looks like it's, it's dead in the first half of the tracing. So this, look, look, there are two parts of the tracing, right? Mm -hmm. got, yeah. what, what do you think is happening here? And we'll always have another I think the top is, uh, it is atrial fibrillation, right? Okay. Looks irregular. This looks, oh, I see. Yeah. That is a little bit, that's, that's a good point. You think it's irregular, right? It looks irregular, yeah. Yeah. But I also do see something at the end of the QRS. Mo that's a requirement, right? Yeah. I'm happy yeah. to say, say that uh, because you're right and wrong at the same time. <laughs> so, right. Good. So you, you, at the end, it's, it's, it's irregular here, right? Yeah. Right? But if you march out here. That looks more regular. That's more regular. Exactly right. So that's a good observation. Do you see P waves here? Uh, no. Not really. But if no, you. No, I don't see P waves. There are P waves. Look, look, look carefully. Look, what, look at this here. I know there's yeah, something at the end of the QRS. I noticed. End of the QRS complex. Look at this. Yeah, is, this, is a, this is a short RP tachycardia. RP, yeah. RP. And you said it slows down here. Yeah. Uh, something happened. Gets, and what is it? What happened here? You, if you look now on this part of the tracing. And that is what you see very classically. Is Why does it slow down? Looks like it's aberrancy now on the other part of the yeah. tracing. It looks like aberrancy. And look at this, how the P wave looks here. So you have the negative P wave here. And now you have positive P, positive P wave here. Yeah. So it's it's just a bit slowed down. Yeah, it the stopped top. here. Yeah. Something stopped here. There was a pause after that. It went yep. aberrancy and the P wave became so, more apparent. So could this be ventricular ectopy? Um, and we, we now the second part of this talk, it will show you because if you look at the morphology here, this is clearly ventricular origin. Look at the right. R wave. So this is, so what happened here? Anybody can help. So, um, so there was retrograde P waves, which is a little bit, um, you know, slower than AVNRT. But when we slow down conduction down the his burning yeah. system, 
um, it starts conducting apparently. So I would think was the reentrance circuit within the Hays bundle. Sure. Is it, I mean, it, it, it looks like the P wave is pretty beyond the QRS more probably I mean, probably more than seventy milliseconds. And I was thinking mm -hmm. of AVRT with the PVC breaking. So okay, good. So now we have differential diagnosis. So this could be AVRT, but it could also be. No range of cardia. Sometimes you can see the P wave coming out. So, but there's different differential diagnosis that this could be AVRT as well. And the question is, this is what you see all very frequently, a pattern like this when you give adenosine. So what you observe correctly is this slow down. And the reason is adenosine kicks in, slow down, and blocks AV conduction. And what you see, what adenosine can do, it can cause ventricular ectopy. That is what you see very, very frequently. And therefore, when you give up adenosine, what is a requirement before you give adenosine? Defib. You have to have the defibrillator close by. Because if this is someone with CAD and a structural heart disease, uh, and had a myocardial infarct, and you give adenosine, and you have these PVCs in use, um, you can push them into ventricular fibrillation. Mm. One to three wow. percent. Um, of the cases. So this is either AV node range to cardia or AVRT, slowing down by adenosine, and then you have sinus rhythm. Okay, good. So AV node range to cardia is located in your AV node and a little bit of tissue gets used around your AV node. And I'll show you a picture in a second. When you have that and you don't see a P wave, do valsalva maneuvers, coronal sinus massage. You can give adenosine. That terminates the tachycardia um, if you're lucky. Not always, uh, but this is this often can terminate tachycardia. Basically, to slow down conduction in your AV node and try to block it. Mm -hmm. These tachycardias are very successfully ablated. In patients who do not want an ablation, they uh, can be treated by a beta blocker or detiazem. If you have short episodes of AV nodal range of tachycardia lasting for 30 seconds, and you have it every two years. There's no reason to do anything um, in the more symptomatic patients are, um, the more uh, you, the, the more aggressive you should be with treatment. OK, so this is where your AV nodal reentered tachycardia sits. OK, so here you have your compact AV node and this is a view area of you. You have your right ventricle, your right atrium. Here is your um, inferior cable vein, superior cable vein. The his bundle penetrates up here, and that is your tricuspid annulus. And typically, what we see in AV nodal range of tachycardia, you have a slow pathway area that sits here next to the coronary sinus, and you have a fast pathway uh, area that usually comes here. So your typical AV nodal range of tachycardia uses a little bit of tissue here and a little bit of tissue here. So it goes around this area here. And where we ablate, we go with an ablation catheter here and ablate the slow pathway. And it's thought that this, this slow pathway is actually an extension of your compact AV node. And you, when you ablate this here, then you have basically ablated one part that is important for your reentrant tachycardia, and you get rid of the tachycardia in 95% of the cases. Okay. Um, when this was invented, we you know, 25 years ago, we sometimes ablated the fast pathway, but what you have is if you ablate this area here, your risk of AV block and permanent pacemaker is 5 to 10%. And you have first degree AV block, right? Because you use always the slow pathway for conduction. So this is the entrance site into your AV node for the fast pathway. So you should not ablate here, you should ablate here. Okay, good. No oh boys, uh, eight or five. But you have to finish this part. Do you have still time? Yes. Good. Uh, I think we should get over the uh, tachy, uh, SVT and we do the um, uh, VT next time. Okay. Tachycardia, guys. Yep. Narrow yep. complex. Mm -hmm. Narrow complex. It's very uh, regular. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, I do see like something of Rikiwaras in lead two. Yes, um, good, Ex excellent. So you see this little dip here, right? Yeah, inverted P waves. Inverted P waves, right? And you see it inverted here too in, in three, right? Mm -hmm. and, and you see it in AVF. Good. So there's a clear P wave. So what, what do you think? What's the mechanism? AVRT, Dr. Schmidt, it's the only one left. AVRT, only one left? Yeah, 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 yeah. So this is AVRT, most likely. That's right. Okay. So AVRT uses, if it goes orthotromic, which it most come in the 90% of the cases, uses your normal conduction system going down the AV node, his Clincher system, oh, uh, and then comes back your accessory pathway. You have a circus movement going around this way, okay? Adenosine you can give, uh, just be prepared if you go, um, if you have a WW with conduction from your atrial to your ventricle, if you have atrial fibrillation induced, you have to be able to cardiovar those patients. These um, WWs are in general ablated because if you have WW, there is a risk of sudden death if this bypass tract conducts fast. Beta blocker deltaism only in concealed bypass tracts. So these are bypass tracts that only conduct from your ventricles to your atria. These medications are contraindicated if you have a WW coming from your atrium to your ventricle, because what you do is you slow down conduction in your AV node. And if you have atrial fibrillation in the setting with beta blocker on board, you have preferential conduction down your pathway. pathway. And those patients have a high risk uh, for sudden death in this setting because of atrial fibrillation. So contraindicated in, in a WW if you have conduction from your atria to the ventricle, but you have sometimes concealed bypass tracts. They only conduct from your ventricle to your atrium, and then you could give this. But in general, these patients have very frequent tachycardia, so in general, they get ablated. So this is how it works in, in WW, uh, the range circuit. So you have, in this case here, you have a PAC, or during your normal sinus conduction, the activation waveform goes into your IV node, slows down, activates your ventricle, but simultaneously activates your ventricle also, we are your bypass tract, and there's no conduction slowing, and because of that, you have this slurred and wide QRS complex. And the more conduction you get via your accessory pathway, the wider the QRS complex is. You have a short PR interval and a very wide QRS complex. Okay, that's during your uh, conduction, okay? If you have a PAC, this PAC usually slows down a little bit more in your AV node, um, and if if it's conduct, conducted, if it's not conducted here in your in your bypass tract, it only goes via your uh, conduction system. So let's look a little bit closer what happens in your EKG. So you have your normal conduction that is shown here. Now you have a PAC, and this PAC shows up here, right? If this PAC is now blocked in your bypass tract, okay, it can go down slowly down your AV node. And in this case, if it blocks in your bypass tract and goes down slowly your AV node, you change the wide QS complex into a narrow QS complex, all right? <laughs> if this is slow enough and comes back, your accessory pathway, you have what we call an AV echo. It goes down back at your atria, and you have here this AV echo here, okay? And then you may have actually a neocompensary tachycardia, a circuit movement down using your conduction by, uh, uh, bypass tract retrogradely to activate your atria. So this is how you establish um, uh, the tachycardia. So you have a YQS complex. If it's blocked in your bypass tract, then the QS complex suddenly gets narrow and you have here an echo. Okay, guys, I think that's it for narrow complex. And we have, oh, uh, yeah. And I think we stop here. What time is it? Oh, all right. <laughs> so what I would like to do next time is, um, we ha I have a couple of ECGs where you give me the diagnosis of what you just learned very quickly, okay? 
And then we go over why complex tachycardia is next time and how you make the diagnosis quickly. Sounds okay? Yes. Thank you, Dr. Schmidt. All right. You, Schmidt. All right. Have a good one. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Dr. Schmidt? Yep. So just a quick question.